annual DEF CON convention. This meeting was held in exciting Las Vegas, Nevada from July 9th through the 11th, 1999. This is video tape number 44, How to Use VO2K. obvious stuff, so if it's blatantly obvious to you, congratulations and you have a clue. Um, first thing you would need to do, obviously, is uh, download probably the international version of VO2K unless you're within the U.S. and you can get the U.S. version, which comes with the plugin for triple dose encryption. Uh, thanks to the government, we can't let that go outside the borders, and uh, people outside the U.S. are not fortunate enough to have strong encryption on the networks. Um, cultdeadcow.com or www.bo2k.com will have it live within a few days and you can download it from there. Um, first thing you're going to want to do is uh, go ahead and just unzip your archive and in the past what would happen would be people would run the server and they would wind up infecting themselves, it would uh, automatically delete and Sirdistic was getting flooded with mail saying, hey why doesn't it work, what happened and it kind of broke on me. Um, this left a rash of people sitting in IRC with port 313 open with no password, getting on left and right, and a hard drive suddenly getting formatted in the middle of the night for no reason. Um, this problem has been corrected, so you cannot walk all over yourself. And when you first run the configuration utility, it starts the wizard. And when you get used to the utility, you can also turn the wizard off so you never have to deal with it again. And you very simply walk through, and it selects the uh, executable as it sits in the directory that it's run out of. You can browse around and have different ones sitting in different subdirectories under different names and have different uh, ports, encryption schemes, uh, plugins and whatnot assembled for uh, whatever specific uses you have. Um, you can select that and move forward. You can move forward. Woo! Check that one out. choice of TCP or UDP networking. Um, the original BO ran on UDP, which was uh, less obvious for people with minimal Windows skills to notice. Um, BO2K moving forward into a more uh, reliable and um, robust uh, program that's more geared towards actual network administration does TCP, where um, in an office corporate type environment, um, as a LAN administrator, uh, you don't care if your clients and your uh, basically co-workers see what you have going on with their machine because you're allowed to and they can just uh, accept it and deal, uh, deal with it. Uh, you're forced to enter a port number and it will not run until you do. And uh, being the US version, this already has uh, three days ready to run on it, so we're going to go with that. And uh, it's recommended you use something at least 14 characters long when you run uh, three days. And then you can finish it right up, and that brings you into what is the actual configuration utility. If you turn the wizard off and you run uh, config, this is what you'll be taken straight to. Um, if you've turned off the wizard and you ever feel the need to turn it back on, you can go into it. Just click on the button right there in the upper corner, and it does bring the wizard back. Once you're inside, you need to select the server that you want to run on. And right here, we already have uh, 3000 uh, enabled on it, and we're going to go ahead right now and add in Bo Peak, which will give us uh, remote administration to the actual desktop and being able to take control of the keyboard and the mouse on it. Um, moving down um, on the configuration, and I hate touch pads, and those little pointy sticks, nothing but a touch uh, trackball should really be allowed. Um, you have several options under uh, file 
file transfer. Basically, these can just be left to sit exactly as they are. Um, configuration is pretty straightforward when you get right down to it. There's a lot of options, and some of them are rather confusing for some people. If you did not run the wizard under TCPIO, default port is where you would set it, and we did set it to 2000. And um, you can easily just tweak it there later on if you don't ever want to fire the wizard back up. Um, UDP is the same thing if you're inclined to run that. Um, Voltan is just a few of the uh, basic encryption modules as well as uh, I.O., which, again, you really don't need to mess with. Um, if you are not using 3 days and you're using XOR, this is where you would put in your encryption key for the XOR encryption. Um, but since we're using 3 days, we can leave that blank right now. Um, startup. Um, Standard networking type is going to be TCP. Um, in the future, as other uh, DLLs and plugins come available for it that allow you to run over different types of uh, protocols, you will be able to set something different in there as well. Uh, binding string is we're going to 2000. Uh, command encryption is 3 does. Uh, authorization, we are just going to leave set at null. And idle timeout is currently set to 60,000, which is good for all intents and purposes, and you should never really have to mess with that either. Um, under stealth, we can configure if we want it to run at startup or not. Um, this is what somebody was asking yesterday, if you saw the CDC release, about being able to put it on a floppy or have it set up to run one time and one time only and not have to um, mess with or leave the machine sitting open after that. And right now it's set to disabled, so if the machine has it uh, set on it, it will not install into the registry and it will not load a boot up. So you do have that um, option right there. If you're doing testing or you don't feel the need to have the server delete itself, you can uh, also have that set to auto-delete or not, and by default that is also disabled. Um, so if you run it on yourself, you're going to have to really check and see if you did or not, because it's not just going to disappear and give you a clue. Um, Insidious is a uh, NT-based setting, which we're not really concerned about. Runtime path name is how it will display itself um, both in the registry if it's installed there and also this is the file that it installs itself as. Uh, BO2K will rename itself in this case to UMGR32 and install itself in the Windows system directory. Uh, we can control if it runs hidden or not. Um, and also we have more NT specific. I don't have NT machines so we're not really going to get into those too much right now. Moving um, further down, the blue folders are your plugins, and the other plugins you add will show up as blue. Um, Triple Dez has the encryption string, which we already put in to show some control inside the uh, uh, the startup wizard for the configuration. And um, the Bo Peep settings, you can control your uh, default for your resolutions, um, your uh, network type, where you're binding to, and this binds to very high port by default, as does the hijack, um, your encryption screen, and your uh, authorization. So it's all pretty straightforward, and uh, we'll leave it at that point. Save it. Yes? Correct. Um, Bo Peep's default uh, encryption screen is XOR, and um, because we are using the US version of 3 does, we do need to change this to 3 does. So we can go ahead and just change it right there, save it up, and save our server again, and, well, that's already setting the other one, so. You would, you would, correct, normally need to go through and also on hijack, change the encryption screen from XOR over to 3 does. So, uh, at that point you can exit it. And hopefully I will be awake by the time the presentation is over. Um, I have uh, the server set up right here to uh, run on this guy. And once you have a server running on a client or a set of clients, you can go to BO2K GUI. Open it up, and by default, you wind up with a blank, untitled workspace. And you can save uh, if you have uh, five or seven servers down below that you use frequently, uh, or if you want to break it up departmental for uh, accounting, human resources, administration. You can run different types of servers with different DLLs for different departments in your company. And you can save these workspaces and open up individual ones and have everything already set up and saved and pre configured for each machine. Um, we're starting a new machine. 
so um, we'll just call it BS server. You need to put in uh, the IP address of the machine, followed by the port that you have it set to run on, and um, you know, already set up for TCP, 3 does, and uh, no off. And we'll say OK and proceed. And um, it comes up, and you've already got everything confirmed at the top. If you need to go back to change anything, you can click right there, and it will bring your configuration back up to change your port or your server. And uh, at this point, we will connect. And this machine is going to bring up stuff that doesn't really matter. And uh, it shows right here, version back off is 2001.0, which shows we are connected. And starting at the top and working our way down, we have the uh, simpler things that were present in the older BO. And you can send simple uh, pin packets off to it, and you will get them back. And they are a bit more reliable since they are TCP-based. Uh, query will basically re-query the server as we just did when we connected, where it will um, query the server for all capabilities, which you'll usually find mostly in the form of plugins down at the bottom. Um, under the system folder, you can have your fun stuff with rebooting the, uh, rebooting the machine, um, locking it up in the event that you uh, have an employee that you happen to find doing something that they shouldn't be or somewhere on the network uh, that was improperly secured. You can lock the machine up to help them from doing anything that they shouldn't be. Uh, you can get a list of any passwords that are present on uh, the machine that have been cached. And you can also go ahead and pull up the system info. And uh, let me enlarge this a bit here. It's not going to get too much better off of uh, the LCD, I don't think, unless we were to come up a lot closer and then we'll treat them. Um, but you can see to pull up the amount of RAM, percentage in use, um, page file spacing, uh, and any uh, drives. It shows that these are uh, fixed. You use a CD-ROM, and it will also show up network drives as being listed as actual network drives, anything mapped out over uh, a Microsoft or a Novell network. Uh, key logging is improved greatly. Um, you can log to any file anywhere you want and uh, go ahead and fire up your login and it shows that key login has actually started and if you were to have something uh, running on the target machine actually go back and uh, a great improvement on BO2K is uh, M keystroke was always present, but you can now go through and actually view your keystroke log. Uh, instead of having to just do an actual view file, which would typically have problems after uh, three or four uh, screens worth of text going on about a 25 row screen, um, the UDP connection would just kind of clog up and you would uh, lose, and sometimes you'd actually have to reping the host or actually wait until it uh, rebooted. And you can see right here, it showed uh, Control escape to go to the start menu, open notepad, um, set uh, testing key logging with several uh, backspaces in it, and then I just backed up and closed it off, and it actually said, I just didn't let that do you want to save, and I actually just hit no for no, and it does actually log that as well. Um, and then you can go through and go ahead and delete your keystroke log if you find it's no longer be of use to you, or if it's something that you've already shipped off to your administration or work on any issues and you don't want anything sitting on your client machine. Um, on the GUI side of things, you can pop up the old familiar system box that looks as legitimate as anything with uh, just the typical OK button. And you've got your uh, box title and any message you want to put inside it. Um, I'd show you, but I don't have the server up on the display, so it's kind of pointless at this point. Under TCP uh, networking, we've got all the fun stuff. Uh, the good old mapping a file server where you can uh, give it a port. And of course, if you're working through a firewall, chances are port 80 is going to be open, so you can throw it on there, uh, pass through a firewall. Um, root path, you can usually leave blank, which will pull up a complete browse of the entire machine, showing any local drives, network drives, as well as uh, the network neighborhood and any network resources it has mapped out. Um, you can um, use it 
to uh, balance a relay like some kiddies like to do with Wingate, where you can give it a port on this machine and give it an IP and a port on another one. You can just go into your server, bounce out, and hit a second machine and port anywhere you want to. And if you're creative, you can chain several of these together and bounce between five or six of them. Um, it works good on the LAN, but anything outside that going over the net, you're going to see a lot of lag on it. Uh, mapping port to a console application was similar to what uh, was shown last year, and in this case, I just grab a uh, port 100 and run uh, command.com, and I can easily tell that to the IP on the port. session that would give me basically a complete DOS prompt uh, on the other machine and I would have full command line access to the whole hard drive and any network resources that that client has available to it. Uh, because this machine is really buggy and it has a lot of network components installed on it that really weren't too conducive to this demo. It's not my machine so I'm kind of uh, stuck. Um, you can also go ahead and just unmap any port. Um, TCP file receive as well as TCP file send um, work in conjunction with Hobbit's Netcat. Um, and it does work really well and it's handy, but Netcat in itself could use at least an hour course. Um, it's a very full featured um, item and it's really fun to play with, so you might want to look into grabbing that. Um, otherwise, you can uh, list any ports that are mapped out on uh, the remote box. And right here you can see that we have port 100, which is shown as being listed over to command.com on it. Um, Microsoft networking is uh, very similar to last time. You can add and remove uh, shares on the remote machine. And when you do so, uh, it does not have the icon in Explorer that shows that it is uh, shared. You don't have the glue hand to it. You just have a standard folder. And to the machine running the server, as far as it's concerned, everything is plain and normal. There's nothing... Uh, odd or distinctly different going on with it. It has drive share and it's uh, completely oblivious to it. Um, I run through on that, but I don't have uh, the sharing installed on the machine, so we're unfortunately at a loss on it. Yes? Correct. You can thank Microsoft for that one. Because basically it would be the same as uh, with the original back office. There's nothing special that this is doing that was not basically uh, included or considered when uh, Windows was coded. It's doing nothing. Um, there's no funny exploits that it's doing short of any DLLs. Uh, but the fact that you can have something uh, shared without it showing as a share is a Microsoft issue. Um, yes? I believe it does. Um, yes. Uh, essentially. Um, if you had it set to, if the machine could share over the firewall on its own, if you could add that machine, turn on sharing and allow it to share through the firewall, then yes. If uh, the firewall was an issue blocking native sharing, then this would not be able to bypass that. Um, and as with the original back office, you can pull up a list of our processes. And actually, it is blank because I have nothing running on it right now. Um, I was just notified that um, the remote machine ID is only for uh, NT and we can leave it blank since we are connected directly to a single server right now. And also I just went ahead and fired up uh, Notepad on it since I actually had nothing running. And you can see that uh, we have Notepad down at the bottom. 
uh, BO2K is showing because I do have it running visible. I did not go through and do any of the cloaking or hiding on it. And um, up above that, we have just a few of the standard MS issues that just sit there and hide resources all day long and don't do much. Um, you can pick any process that you would like to kill. And uh, for instance, I can go right here and highlight and copy the uh, idea of that process. I can right click and copy it. Uh, I can go to kill process, paste it into, pay, into uh, the box, send my command, and it now has been terminated. And if we go back and check again, uh, you can see that Notepad is no longer running and BO2K is the last entry. So you do have full uh, process control over whatever's going on in the remote machine. Um, registry, you do have um, pretty much the same functionality as before. Um, you can go through and list keys, you can view their files, uh, values, you can delete their values, um, set and create keys completely from scratch. Um, this is a kind of a tough way to do it. You really need to know the registry and have regedit right open on your machine and hope you don't accidentally delete something on your side by accident with a bad mouse click. Um, however, and um, I would like to show it to you right now, but I don't have it handy. When BO Tool is released from Loft Heavy Industries, um, the reg editing that is absolutely phenomenal. And it opens a reg edit box, which is just like running reg edit on your local machine. And it's all point and click. And it's very easy to just click on something, edit a value. You can surf around and view it as a tree. You don't have to know exactly where everything resides. Um, but you do have full remote registry control. And you do not have to have shared remote registry activated inside of the Microsoft networking on the remote machine, which is kind of a cluster in itself. Um, again, we have uh, any multimedia listings. Um, I have nothing running on this other machine, but you can easily list capture devices, and it will list any uh, microphones. If I had the cam, I would have it plugged in right now, but it was left at home. Um, but you can plug in uh, uh, the cam on it, and I can easily go through, and that is listed as device zero. And if I wanted to capture a video still or an AVI, I could uh, get my device number, which in this case would have been zero instead of 100. Uh, give it a file name to save to, and as an uh, AVI, I would select the seconds and the width and the height um, and color depth of it. And when you enter these values, it's the number followed by the comma followed by the next value. You don't want to leave any spaces in, or most likely it's not going to work for you. Um, if you were to search around using um, uh, the file search, which we'll get to in a minute, or if you're using BO tool and you search around and find some interesting WAV files, or if you upload some to the machine, you can easily play them, and we now have the nice annoying factor of being able to play them in a loop and just bug the heck out of somebody. Um, remind your boss that you need a raise, maybe. Um, you can also, in addition to the AVIs, capture a still, which will get you just a single uh, picture of the person sitting in front of the camera or whatever happens to be going on in the office at that time. Um, or you can capture a screen, which is just a simple capture of the desktop itself. And you can download that through the HTTP server if you have that fired up or using Netcat and the file transfer. Uh, under file and directory, we've got a lot of functions to play with. Um, you can list anything that resides inside of uh, uh, any file and path. And here's everything pulled up. Um, and it actually has attributes that are listed to it. Um, so you can see if any files are hidden, if you want to hide or unhide a file, um, you can change uh, read and write attributes to anything. Um, actually, attributes can be changed through BO tool as well as through the attributes as well. Uh, you can find files and you can search off the root of any directory. Uh, you can search through any path under a root of any uh, drive on it. Uh, Wildcards are accepted in the file name, uh, star.wave, star.gif, um, any uh, exe if you have anything in particular you're looking for that you need to find or remove. Um, you have any full search stuff that is available to you. And once you find it, you can just go ahead and cut it and paste it in to the box and delete what any uh, file you'd like to get rid of. You have a view file which works best on text documents. Um, I would recommend using it on any Microsoft Word documents or Excel sheets because it doesn't really look too pretty. Um, it does work well on text and on uh, uh, keystroke logs, which is how you would actually previously view it if you didn't download it and view it locally. Uh, you can move and rename files. Uh, you can copy a file from one directory 
one to another. Uh, make and remove directories, file attributes, um, sends and receives. Um, emits, I'm actually not sure on. And you can list uh, any transfers that you have currently queued up that are in process. And right now it should show as nothing because we have nothing going on. Um, but you do have full file access to the uh, remote machine completely. And you can, as we show, go through and actually find hidden and uh, uh, read only files and change access to those however you feel fit to take care of whatever you need to. Um, again, also, if you do a capture to a BMP, or if there's a large file on the uh, server machine that you need to download to yourself, uh, you can freeze it, and um, which basically is a uh, compression, and on a BMP that is normally about a meg and a half, freezing typically drops to about 300k. So you can shrink things down and reduce your network traffic overall, and if you're over a dial-up or a very limited pipe, you can move large files um, that are compressed a lot quicker. Um, DNS, you can uh, use the remote machine's DNS servers instead of your own to pull up any information that you may be having trouble to resolve if your DNS is down or if you don't have anything of your own. Uh, you can resolve host names on the remote uh, machine as well as addresses and do reverse lookups. So that's a new feature that's kind of nice to play with. Um, if you find yourself uh, using this to admin a large WAN in a corporate environment where you have uh, several offices across several cities or states, um, and you're having trouble with the machine on one end, uh, not being able to hit something, you could actually go into the remote machine from your office and try to look up the target that he's trying to hit and see if he does actually have a problem with his DNS and try to troubleshoot it from there and figure out if it's actually a problem uh, with the DNS server or his local DNS configuration. Uh, server control. You can shut down a server if you wanted to run at one time, but you just use your standard uh, BO executable that you have running constantly. Um, you don't feel like rolling a new one. You can run it till you're done using it and shut it down. Uh, if you run it and type in delete, it will shut itself off and delete itself and leave no trace that it was ever there. Um, you can restart the server. You can load and unload plugins. Uh, you can debug plugins remotely. Um, you can list any plugins that are present. And right here it says that we have both uh, the triple dies and Bo Peep loaded. Um, you can start and uh, kill off any command sockets associated with it. Yes? Yeah, you can, you can upload it through the HTTP server or using file transfer. You can upload it and dump it into uh, C colon Windows system. And you can easily load it from inside server control. And also, BO2K does have support for the legacy butt plugs that were out um, initially with uh, uh, butt sniffer, the packet sniffer, um, the uh, butt trumpets and whatnot. The original um, plugins are supported. And the software development kit, um, that is um, available with the uh, is going to allow you to do a lot of the uh, more functional ones that take a lot of advantage of the newer functions built into the O2K. Um, yes? 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 I don't fully understand the question. DNS is strictly a matter of just doing a query on a DNS server. Same as if you were to uh, do something uh, using one of the IP-based command lines inside of Windows, like ping or trace route, and it just basically does a, a DNS lookup. It doesn't do anything other than lookups. Yes? Um, you can dump route tables if you were to set up um, Find a command like command.com to a port and turn it in. You, you can look them up that way. So, um, Bo Peep, we're going to attempt to fire up here. I'm going to set the uh, frame rate rather low uh, just initially, and then we can turn it up from there. And ideally, it should fire. 
fire up, and it shows that the VIX stream is started at the IP and at the IP or at the port 15151, which we recall we looked at earlier when we put uh, BO into the server and the config utility. One thing, in order to use uh, DLLs, you need to make sure that you have configured them inside your client as well. So right here we have triple does, and in order to use Go Peep, I will need to add it. This is the same Go Peep DLL that we put into the server that we installed on the other machine. You install it into your client. And we can go through here and Go Peep. And I'm going to leave all the settings the same. And we will need to go through again and change the encryption over to three does. From XOR, I'm going to set the value on that one. And also on Hijack, I will need to come down and change this to three does as well. And we'll say done. And if all worked well, once we have BO running down on the server, we can go to plugins. You can see we now have a Bo Peep plugin. And when BO Tool is released, you will have that listed down here. And any other plugins that actually enhance the communication between the server and the client will appear off this menu. So theoretically, we should be able to hit uh, the Bitstream client and fire up connects. And this will pull up everything that has already been preset into it. And you can verify your settings of your port. Uh, we are using TCP, and we did set it to three does, as well as the standard model authentication, and it's not happy with us. see too much because I'm running a rather small window on it. You can see as I move the mouse around. Okay. Oh my! You're not seeing this right now. And what we can actually do to make things a little nicer is uh, disconnect and come up here and actually turn the frame rate up a bit. And this does work best over a LAN. Um, and we will connect it in. And we should notice some uh, much more fluid movement on the remote machine. So, um, as CDC demonstrated yesterday, you can go ahead and turn the, uh, the window size up quite a bit. Um, and the fun thing about this is we can actually shrink this down out of our way temporarily. And, uh, get rid of my second one. We can go over to Plugins, open up OP, and go to the Hijack Client window. And we can pull up Connect. And this is just something that was set um, earlier as the port 10. Uh, sorry. 14141. And all the other values are correct, and we can connect to this as well. Bummer. Oh, yeah. Okay. Getting ahead of myself. I actually need to uh, start hijack first. And we now have hijack started. Once again, we can connect and dump in the IP for the server we're on. And the hotkey is currently shown as being control at Z. And what I'm going to do here is uh, pull this back up. And if I control at Z, I First kind of start. Click over, I now have the red dot, and as I move that over here, I now have control of the remote desktop. Um, it looks kind of odd, but what happens is where the red dot is at represents where the mouse is actually sitting on the remote machine. So I move far off of my actual Vidstream client window, but we can move around here and take a look at everything that is sitting on this desktop. And we have full control over that as well as the remote keyboard. Uh, when you fire this up, you uh, essentially lock out the remote keyboard. So if you have a user that's having problems with something, you can, uh, from your desktop, 
take over their machine, um, fix their problem for them, and get them on their merry way. You can go back to playing Quake or sitting in IRC or what have you. And uh, <laughs> what it is we get paid for. <laughs> And uh, I shot a little far off the start, maybe. Um, uh, yes, it can be made bigger. I'm just running it small right now for my own peace of mind, basically. But you can actually make it almost... Uh, I know you can get up into the 300s and the 400 ranges. Um, I've never tried to push it bigger than that. Um, unfortunately, the segment I'm on at work has a bit of traffic, and I never wanted to push it too much further. So, um, especially since they didn't know what I was doing in that all day long. <laughs> and this is just not being friendly with me today. But basically, if I would have had a window open, I could actually type into it, and the remote mouse and keyboard is completely locked out, and uh, renders it completely useless for the user, so they can't interfere and, you know, ideally mess anything up too much for them than they already have. Uh, if you're playing around with this at home, a word of caution uh, is to not um, load up their peep and hijack your own workstation because your keyboard is not happy about trying to be locked out and controlling it at the same time. Uh, I control Alt Z again and you can see where uh, Connect is now turned off and I resume control to the remote machine and I take control again of my own desktop. So that is one of the cooler functions of it, in my opinion. Um, you can also, under connection details, um, fill up the box, and um, it shows at the bottom we have the IP address and port of the machine, the uh, current time that's listed, and as anything is going on over here, it shows our actual uh, network traffic usage and how much is going across the wire. So you get an idea as to how much you may or may not be clogging things up in the process. And uh, I'm going to dump that connection right now as well. Um, also, when you do have it fired up, you do have a copy option. So if you were to find a user doing something inappropriate and you need to use it to justify uh, funds from accounting to, say, purchase a better firewall or uh, anything that you deem useful, you can snap a picture of your desktop to clipboard and paste it in the email and send it off to management the only merry way. Um, Redes does not show up in the client because it's just a matter of encryption. It's built into the running uh, server, and you've got it built in um, under your plugins. Um, so there's uh, nothing that actually Redes would ever show up for. It basically just lets you put in your encryption key, and that's that. Um, do we have any questions? Yes. The question was to show the debug plugin option, and uh, let's see here, There's one of the plugins that we have which is listed below, and the three does is actually a bad option to show it off of. Um, not too happy about that um, Yeah, that was a very bad example for me to choose. <laughs> um, we'll get back to that in one moment. Any other questions right now? Yeah, and, sure, yes. That, to be truthful with you, I'm actually not entirely sure. Um, okay, um, you can set up an SSH tunnel and route through that. Um, otherwise, um, there's not one heck of a lot you can do because the whole purpose of masquerading is to block everything off. Um, unless you felt completely secure, um, I don't know, I would pretty much stick with SSH. I wouldn't even want to consider anything else because it would become a vulnerability at that point. Um, as it stands, as you would download it, no. But uh, the way it is set up with the software development kit and the abilities of the plugins and whatnot, uh, yes. If somebody can write a plugin to do it, BO2K is capable of it. Um, you'll notice when we actually configure the server, um, if you remember the original BO, you put in a uh, IP, either a range or a uh, 
just an actual IP address and a separate box for the port. You notice on this one, everything is done with putting an IP and then a colon and then the port. And by illuminating an actual value for a port that's independent of itself, uh, you can hook into um, something with a modem. You can have uh, a DLL that is set up to uh, watch the modem for ringing, answer it on X number of rings, and you can set it up. Uh, the DLL would be able to, on the uh, client side right here, uh, dial out to a uh, specific number that would connect and authenticate, and then you would have total remote control of that machine. And using uh, the hijacks and their peep, you could then have PC Anywhere style control over that machine. And the nice thing about it is if anybody happened to be tapping your phone line, you would have triple dose encryption for the entire session as well. Um, the triple dose is not used just for authentication, but anything going between the two machines is completely encrypted to uh, help prevent against uh, any sniffing attacks. So it can support it. So there you go, in front. Um, the question was, can we log time that an application was started and ended? Um, by default, no, but again, um, a plugin could easily take care of that. Um, with the original BO where um, it was, uh, Writing plugins was not too hard to do. The software development kit is going to make it a lot easier and give you a lot more functions and abilities than you had in the past. So you can do all sorts of stuff from, like we said, um, writing an interface that will allow direct serial communication to uh, serial communication over a modem. Um, you can have something that will log um, uh, file times. You could probably write a DLL that would actually um, track something similar to WinTop usage and see if a uh, user complains about a slow machine exactly why, if you had something that was consuming too many resources. Um, and also something that uh, will probably be coming out in the future um, that somebody could easily code for it is an IPX SPX DLL, which would allow you to run this on a Novell network with 195 clients where you don't actually code any IP addresses on the machines and it's all set up through uh, the Novell server and the MAC address on the card. So uh, ideally you'll have um, availability for that as well. And as Dildog said yesterday, something that would even allow it to communicate over Apple Talk as well and uh, port the server down to something that would run on uh, a Mac. And you could have a Windows machine controlling a Mac or vice versa. So it, it was written completely open to allow for many variations of it and whatnot. Um, and allow you to just make something completely flexible. And like they said, they expect in a short amount of time um, a lot of different variations of it to be turning up on FTP sites and web pages where you could have somebody uh, take it and strip out features that they deem unnecessary for their network administration, which will make the server a lot smaller, um, easier to transport across a modem maybe. Um, something that would almost set up what would appear to be an anonymous FTP server on a box on a cable modem or DSL. Um, so there's going to be a, a lot of variations that you're going to be seeing, seeing popping up that will do a lot of things that we're not even conceptualizing right now that will hit somebody in you know, just a craze and they'll code and whip out. And it's really going to be expanding at epic proportions, I really think. So, um, yeah. Okay, uh, the question was in an environment where whenever the machines go to power down on a legitimate uh, shutoff, they get a re-ghosted image copied over from a uh, network server that they're connected to, and how this would um, function in that environment. Um, one of the easiest things you can do 
to circumvent that is if it's a server, um, if they're connected to a server map where it will attempt to shut itself down and reghost its image, then there's a server that it's equally logging into every time it's powered up. And you can easily, in the machine or user or system login script, have BO automatically run off uh, the server itself, and it will reinstall itself every time the machine is booted up. Theoretically, yes. Several times in the past with the original back office, I would find uh, several machines uh, with um, a stock server running on port 31337 with no password. And looking around, I would uh, hypothetically be on a machine and find two or three other servers running and those kitties actually fighting each other for control of the server. And, uh, <laughs> And just each one would find it, they would upload their server and run it, but they would never kill the process of the default one, so other people would take it and keep uploading and running servers on different ports, different passwords. Um, just by listing processes and looking for anything running from C colon Windows system with a file size about 120 some K for recent upload dates. So, um, you got a question? Yes. Um, you can actually go through and in your BoKeep setup for both your client and your server, it has defaults for the X and the Y uh, window sizing. So you can go ahead and you can set it to, uh, if you want to be bold, uh, 480 by 600, if you wanted to default it to a large window, you can default large windows, you can save it, and when you uh, launch um, BoPeep on the remote one and on your uh, server for control, it will automatically pop open to whatever size you've got it coded and saved for, and then you'll be running at that window size constantly unless you want to resize. I don't know. <laughs> It's built in uh, by default. Um, in the international versions, the stripped down version of BL where 3 does is not included. It defaults to an XOR encryption screen, and you have 3 does as an option, but it's XOR or you're not running BL, pretty much. It's, it's there, and that's all you can do about it. So it will be encrypted to some degree. It's, it's more network traffic. Um, if you try to run it at a high frame rate, it will be uh, slowing things down. Over a LAN, you can run at, like I was at 10 uh, uh, frames per second, you can increase that. You can increase the window size on the LAN. 100 megabit LANs you can push further, but if you're trying to do something over a modem, you're going to want a small window. And uh, it's just a matter of bandwidth, basically. But um, just like anything with you know, more graphic intensive and more data be transmitted, you're going to be really throwing a lot more packets down the wire. So.
having some sort of a um, real video type of client on the server and taking that and encoding it and throwing that through Bo Peep and using that instead of the actual Bo Peep itself. Um, conceptually, how hard it would be to code can, depends, I guess, on how skilled of a coder somebody is. Um, but uh, it's, again, feasible to do something like that. You could almost feasibly uh, write a DLL that would watch a quick cam, and instead of dumping it to uh, a box on the screen, you could almost dump that down a uh, Bo Peep style plugin and open up a window on your machine and almost watch a very uh, slow, choppy, um, real-time video of somebody sitting at their computer typing. So you could actually go so far as to build in something like that as well. That's what I was actually aiming towards was using like the quick cam on the remote machine and actually having the DLL hijack that feed instead of going to hard disk on the local or yours is actually run it over the wire. So you've had your hand up for a while. Um, you mean under NT? Uh, yeah, that was actually, Dildog actually explained in um, very great detail yesterday exactly how that's accomplished. And it can be done and it will write itself as an actual system process. Um, we can try to find a way to give you the actual rundown on that if you'd like. But it is, it is possible and it does work. Yes. I'm actually waiting for a Blowfish plugin myself. Um, theoretically, not too hard. Um, again, everything on this is completely open. Um, it's completely open source. It is GPL. Um, you can uh, write DLLs for it, uh, left and right, using uh, the software development kit, which will make things very easy. Um, you can, uh, the entire uh, source code for BO itself is going to be made available. So you could actually uh, almost hard code it in if you were so inclined. Um, but uh, Blowfish encryption should not be too hard to implement. I'm just thinking just the way people think and work. It'll probably be out in a few weeks, if not sooner. So. The question is, is there a way to nice defined file feature so it doesn't interfere with what the user is doing? Uh, to my knowledge, there is not. Um, okay, um, BO2K runs below normal priority, so anything that it executes will also fall at that point or lower and will not interfere that much with anything going on on the user side. Um, I have noticed uh, in doing it that they will uh, pick up, you know, obvious uh, noticeable hard disk activity. Um, but also, if you wanted to poke around a certain directory or um, a certain portion of a tree, um, you can use uh, the directory listing and type in the path that you're looking at and manually look for files in there. Or uh, using the uh, graphical video tool when that comes out, the file browser in that is really magnificent too, so that'll cut down on a lot. Is it possible to change the priority? Um, I would imagine since the source code is available, you could code it to run at a different um, level inside it. Um, it currently is set to run, like we said, lower, and it does grab the OS at ring zero, but that should honestly be modifiable as well. Yeah. Um, Dead on? Dead? ICMPIO, is that implemented? Okay, uh, the question was, uh, is the ICMPIO uh, that was discussed yesterday available and that will be coming out in the Loft Heavy Industries pack when that's available? So, yeah. Okay, um, the first
first question was, as a network administrator, how do I protect myself from this? Um, a few of the obvious ones uh, would be the same way you protect yourself from any virus, aside from actual virus scanning, is uh, cut yourself off from the outside world as much as you can while still allowing uh, work to be done in a fair and reasonable fashion. Um, Limit uh, any mail attachments that are over a certain size. Um, anything over a certain size can be sent to an administrator and assistant for uh, manual review. Um, let's see. Um, educate your users. The, the human factor is always going to be the downfall. Um, and that's why BO spread so fast in the first place. That's why an Australian ISP had 79% uh, of their machines infected, of their clients. Um, people aren't exactly the sharpest uh, creatures sometimes, so uh, educate your users not to be downloading stuff off the web or restrict their access to sites they need to uh, you know, perform their uh, job duties. Um, but just simple common sense that you would use to keep anything else out of your network that you don't want in. Um, if you're really concerned about it, you can try to block off uh, all ports that you don't need on your firewall, but then again, this can be configured to run over port 80, and um, that combined with NetCat, you can actually use to open connections from the inside as well. So um, there are always going to be some sort of loopholes that people are going to try to get through. Um, the other question was, how do I use this as a uh, land administrator while avoiding the antivirus utilities? Um, there is a big push on this to make this uh, seen as being as legitimate of a administration tool as possible. Um, and frankly, I completely find it to be one. Um, I've been using BO to uh, admin my network since it came out last year. Um, I've been helping with this for the last two months, and it's actually helped me work quite a bit. I've got a uh, Novell network with about 295 boxes on it, and it's made my life a lot easier. Um, as for protecting yourself from the virus side of it, um, the antivirus side, um, that's a tough one. Um, if people start throwing signatures in, it's going to be getting hit. Um, if you have a skilled coder handy that can modify the source code so it will not generate the same file signature, uh, you can try to uh, step around it that way. Uh, and there's also hope that ideally uh, companies will not bow to Microsoft and include it as being um, a natural virus because when you consider uh, when the newest version of NetBus came out, um, several companies were actually saying because the guy decided to charge for it finally and call it an uh, administration tool that it suddenly was one just because he changed the name on it and uh, it still is uh, useful or malicious as well as back office was or PC anywhere can be. Um, and you know the fact that he, uh, the author of it, even went so far as to say that you know uh, mess with your friends by ejecting their CD-ROM constantly doesn't sound like something that an administration tool would have included in its README file. But virus companies still thought that it was legitimate enough to not include it. Um, ideally, uh, this product will be stepping up to the plate and taking on some of the heavy hitters like PC Anywhere, uh, which, um, in my experience, over a uh, Using it over a LAN at 100 megabit remote control the desktop is still choppy and painful at best. Um, this is uh, much smoother and better, I find, and uh, a lot more handy to use than PC anywhere. Um, and also one thing was uh, MSNBC had an article uh, quoting someone, and I forget who in the company he was with, pointing out how this is nothing more than another malicious tool because it runs stealth and uh, can be configured to not show up in the process list or in the taskbar or anything of the sort. And as uh, Dildog pointed out yesterday, um, Microsoft incorporated that ability on purpose due to a wide range of customer requests. And uh, something I pointed out to MSNBC, um, IBM has a package called the Netfinity Manager, which sells for upwards of $10,000 for a, a small set of licenses um, that run stuff. And as a network administrator, I know that um, I've had users I have like, set to open their email in their startup folder, and several of them are under the habit of booting their machine, closing everything, and then bitching at me that they haven't gotten email for three days. So users can easily defeat an administration utility either maliciously or completely by accident. So the fact that it runs stealth uh, is right up there with the big leagues with IBM and Hewlett Packard and their desktop uh, administration utilities. So um, hopefully the virus companies will take a clue and not decide to just sweepingly ban this and let it uh, grow and be what it, what it can legitimately be used for. Yeah. So, 
Yes. It has to start somehow, and that's how it does load right now. Uh, he asked if it does load itself into the registry key and to run services like back office did originally, and the answer is yes, it does. So if you think you or a machine that you admin or um, a friend's machine might be infected, you can check there, check the five or so items that are typically in run services and compare them against uh, file sizes or anything fishy that's sitting in uh, the Windows system directory and see if it's uh, BO or BO2K or not. Yeah. Okay, a uh, good point was just brought up that uh, some virus pa uh, packages that do run over LANs for uh, large settings, you can exclude certain files, and you can easily just include this in uh, an excluded file as well, and not have to worry about it. Um, by default, the name of it is umgr32.exe. And if a virus scanner was to uh, look for that or consider that to be something that would match a signature, you could easily rename it to uh, your initials, the initials of your company, your phone extension number. You can uh, rename the server to anything you want and include your specific file size because there's a chance that anybody that uh, tries to take your network may have different DLLs loaded than you do and they would obviously not match up to your exact file. So, yes. Currently, the question was, any plans on merging, hijack, and BoPeep? Um, right now, BoPeep consists of um, two separate uh, portions of it that actually make up BoPeep, and one is the video hijack, and one is the keyboard hijack. And as I actually have them open, you can run the two windows side by side. You can shrink the uh, um, hijack client out of the way. You can shrink the actual BO2K uh, desktop that we have open right now completely out of the way and have nothing but the vid screen open and hijack the keyboard. Um, sometimes you do want to uh, hijack video and not keyboard just to monitor a user or say, you know, if you're on a, your intercom with them, say, show me what you're doing so I can see what you're doing wrong and you can actually walk them through and attempt to educate them at the same time and see where they're messing up. So you don't always want to take control of the keyboard. But the two can run simultaneously side by side and it's not a problem. So, uh, come back. The question was options on blinking the user's screen. Uh, that is not part of BO2K. Um, you could probably as easily, again, um, not to sound repetitive, write a DLL or modify the BoPeep DLL to include a blinking option. Um, although, by and large, for the most part, um, as an administrative tool, that's rarely called for because if you have control of a user's desktop, you're logged in as the user with their permission, so you're not going to be touching any part of the network that they shouldn't be seeing anyways. And ideally, uh, one thing that I'm big on is not just fixing my problems, but ideally trying to educate my users so they can work more efficiently themselves. So I personally like having the video displayed so they can see what I'm doing and hopefully learn something and not have the same problem again in the future. But blinking screen is something that you could probably easily build in. Or you could uh, just manually launch the blank screen screensaver. <laughs> Stream it out. I mean, uh, the question was doing live keyboard logging and having it actually um, dump live over the stream uh, to your uh, client instead of writing it to a file. Um, that's something that could feasibly be done through a DLL, but the problem you would run into um, is if you leave the DLL running and you shut your server off and the connection breaks, it may cause a problem or network congestion on the, the server side. So. Yeah, you could just watch in real time. <laughs> um, that could work. Um, I haven't tried it. So, theoretically, it could be there, and if not, a DLL could probably take care of it. So, um, and back.
Non-interactive deployment capabilities down the line. Um, yes and no. Um, if you're doing it as a land administrator, um, what I've done is I, um, with the original BO, which had the auto-delete built in and there was nothing you could do, I put it in a uh, readable-only directory on my file server, which users cannot delete from, and put it in the login script and just had it sit there for about a week to make sure all machines have been turned on at one point in time. Um, and at that point, the machines would boot up, a user would log in, it would run BO and automatically install itself on the machine without any user intervention or even knowledge that I'd done anything similar to that. And it wouldn't delete, it would sit there waiting for the next machine to boot up and uh, run it also. Otherwise, um, in order to have it install on a, somebody's machine in a malicious way, um, there's the old problem that they came up with last time with uh, buffer overflows and using that to execute malicious code. Um, or you could um, dig up the old, it wasn't an actual plugin, but uh, Brian Enigma from NetNinja uh, wrote something called Saran Wrap, where you could easily take that BO or any file and wrap it in and just confuse somebody. And um, you could do that to make them think it's something else. Um, you could wrap a program that they use frequently, like ICQ, so every time they run ICQ, it reinstalls itself in case they happen to catch it. Or just take it and rename it to something like BigTits.exe. And, uh, let them do it on their own. Okay. Uh, I've just been noted. I'll take one more question. Yes. Um, the question was, if a client machine is in a mode where your screensaver is turned on and I were to hijack the controls on it, would it uh, click it off? Um, I don't know, but we can try to find out real fast. <laughs> machine is in a screensaver mode and you hijack uh, the keyboard and try to take control if it will turn the screensaver off or not. And I'm actually having trouble because it seems like the battery is about done. Um, For the record, I was just informed that we are about uh, 10 minutes over right now. So uh, we're going to wrap this up here uh, right quick. Um, I would like to thank uh, CDC for having me do this demo, which has been uh, kind of cool. Uh, Dildog for coding this monster. And um, I'd like to thank uh, Bomb and Crusader for setting up with some laptops so we can get this thing going. And uh, everybody for sitting here and your interest in putting up with uh, me for the last hour plus. And just for the record, the screensaver was turned on and hijacking the stream alone turned it off. So without even going into the keyboard hijacking, hijacking something with a screensaver on will automatically kill the screensaver. So there you have it.